Astonishing Legends would like to thank Skylight Frames, Squarespace, Best Fiends, The Great Courses Plus, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. In 1762, King Louis XV of France secretly ceded a vast territory in North America known as Louisiana, which France had controlled for 63 years, to King Charles III of Spain. Within 20 years, King Charles was in control of the entire Mississippi River Valley, the jugular vein of shipping and commerce for the New World. Spain would also control all the land surrounding the Gulf of Mexico, including Florida and everything west of the Mississippi River to the Pacific and north up to Canada. However, yet another secret agreement, the Third Treaty of San Ildefonso, signed in October of 1800, now gave control of Louisiana back to France in exchange for territories in Tuscany, Italy. Louisiana, at that point, was 830,000 square miles of land containing all or portions of what is today 15 states and even a few small southern pieces of the Canadian provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Soon, the fledgling United States of America, with only a dozen or so states in its union at the time, would be able to expand westward. Circumstances aligned when France failed to quash a revolution in Saint Domingue, or modern-day Haiti, that had been orchestrated by self-liberated slaves. That, and the possibility of more battles with the United Kingdom, put Napoleon in the mindset of selling the territory of Louisiana to the United States a goal that President Thomas Jefferson had been pursuing for quite some time. He wanted the U.S. to control all the shipping and commerce that would enter at the Port of New Orleans and make its way well into the heartland of his vision for the future of America. President Jefferson got his wish in 1803, when the United States made the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon for $15 million, or about $18 per square mile. Although Louisiana wouldn't become a state for nine more years, the United States now owned the Port of New Orleans. That means it controlled the flow of goods from not only the Caribbean, but the rest of the world into the heart of the United States' newest territory. Or did it? Before the ink was even dry on the Louisiana Purchase, an opportunistic villain, slave trader, and pirate, or as he preferred, privateer, named Jean Lafitte, simply appeared out of nowhere in New Orleans, along with his literal partner in crime, his brother Pierre. In short order, they set up a blacksmith shop at 941 Bourbon Street in the French Quarter, which turned out to be a front for what would become one of the most profitable piratical and smuggling enterprises in history. Jean and Pierre would soon be strangling the port of New Orleans by rerouting stolen goods through the Louisiana bayous and backwater alleys thanks to extensive navigational knowledge of the area and a stronghold south of the city that allowed shipping traffic to bypass the main port entirely. The nascent U.S. government would be no match for Jean and Pierre Lafitte. And in fact, the local governor seemed utterly unequipped to stop their powerful organization. One can only imagine the vast wealth they accumulated during their time, or where they may have secreted some of it away. And New Orleans is only chapter one of their story. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Patriotic at one act, yet not a patriot. Piratical through a lifetime of activities, yet not a pirate. He was, he is, legend, paradox, mystery. Author J. Frank Doby from his book Coronado's Children, Grosset and Dunlap, New York, 1930. Join us tonight for part one of our two-part series on the pirate Jean Lafitte and his brother Pierre. And we're back. That we are. But uh, realistically, where else would we go? <laughs> well, that's a very, very good point, <laughs> I guess, to we're the We're not store. just back. We've been here. <laughs> well, we've both, we've all been stuck wherever we are. Frankly, a lot of this does not seem all that different, although I really am enjoying the light, light LA traffic. So everybody in LA, please just continue to stay at home. Yeah, because you're the one, I actually am recording from my home, but you actually have to drive to our studio there. And that's been a whole different experience, I guess, right? Free and liberating. Yeah, like the... Uh, the, the was the woman on uh, on uh, Star Trek on the 
original series where she's dancing around the the ship. Oh yeah, because on her planet everyone is standing shoulder to chest, uh, oh yes. cheek to jowl, and it's yeah. like uh, that creeped me out as a kid. Yeah, yeah that I, episode I can't imagine was that super spooky. But I feel like her. Ah, that's nice. Well, we want to thank everybody who joined us for the fourteen buzz kills and rich roundtable number one last week. There's been a lot of positive feedback on it, and time, space, and distance allowing, I'm sure we'll be doing that again. Yeah, we might try that again. Well, it turned out pretty well. And for those of you that are patrons of ours at patreon.com slash astonishing legends, you can now find the first ever recorded Zoom video session of that show, mostly unedited, if you're supporting us over there. Uh, yeah, check it out. Assemble that one myself in Adobe Premiere. Mm. The, uh, the audio edit is not as smooth as Sarah's cuts, because if I did that, it would look like a strobe light was in use. But uh, The jump one... cuts you're talking about, <laughs> yes, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, okay. she, she smoothed that all out. You can't see those in audio, but if I matched that ah. with the video, we would be super steppy. But one thing I did do was I put titles up at the bottom of the screen whenever we change topics. So if you're bored with what we're talking about, which <laughs> I predict is... <laughs> possible mm, likelihood. Very you likely. Can, you can just scroll through the movie, and when a title comes up at the bottom, you can see what the next thing is and, and move it to there if you want to. Also, this video is commercial-free, and as we said for now, at least, it is for our patrons only, but it is available in these trying times for patrons at all levels uh, from a dollar and up. So just Ah, to brilliant, sir. Yes, very nice. We also recorded our interview with Terry Lovelace on the incident at Devil's Den, didn't we? Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. I almost forgot. We did that a while back, and that's going to be the next thing we upload to Patreon in the next week or two. It, it takes some time to assemble and edit those, but we'll be posting that next. And for those of you that were sucked into Terry story. Wait till you see the video of that interview. I don't know mm. why, but it, his face is like coming in and out of the darkness wherever he was recording. <laughs> and it adds a, another layer to the creep factor of his story. It might be that I'm procrastinating on that edit a little bit. I'm not sure I want to sit with that for <laughs> well, a whole day. But. <laughs> it's it's a perfectly normal Zoom. We're all used to uh, seeing I know, that now. I think was it was, like it was the middle of the lighting. Room. It's almost like he was wearing a black turtleneck in a dark room. And you know, Oh, I see. But, yeah, I, yeah. but I, I will say this. It makes the story even more compelling because you he just exudes honesty or belief in what he is saying. And you can really see that when you watch him talk. So Yeah, no, that is a factor that you don't get just from listening to the audio, certainly. But it's what we tried to relay during our interview with him and that when you talk to him, again, we weren't in person, but when you see him face to face and he's telling a story and we're chatting for a long time before and after the interview session, that's what comes across. That ring of truth, really. So... You're going to want to check that out. And that story really struck a chord with people, you could say, right down to the chilling of their bones because of that and the nature of the story. And I believe I'd heard a rumor that there was some updates or something new that happened with him. So we're going to have to circle back and find out what that story is. All right. Well, here's our last announcement before we get the show going tonight. We wanted to give a shout out to a talented graphic artist and designer that we actually haven't mentioned on the show before. His name is Tommy Beaver. He's been a friend of mine for some time now, and we're currently talking to him about some future secret projects for Astonishing Legends. And Tommy's more than just a designer. He's an artist and an illustrator on top of that, with over 25 years of experience working with not only ad agencies, but all sorts of freelance clients as well. It's one of those websites that you would just look at anyway, just to look at the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so fun to yes. kind of see his designs. And uh, he- Yes, and his Instagram too. Absolutely. And he may have some fun stuff coming up for us that we're just kicking around ideas at the moment. Yes. Yeah, well, I, I will say this. Tommy is a rare breed of collaborative artist who actually enjoys as much interaction as possible with his clients. He really likes to make sure you're getting what you want, and in spite of being wildly talented, he also has an easygoing and professional demeanor that makes working with him a piece of cake, and that combination of talent and collaboration can be very hard to find, believe me. Absolutely. So whether you're looking for a logo or a beautiful poster for something you're working on, or an illustration, or even storyboards for a shoot, Check his work out at TommyBeaverDesign.com. He's got the talent and disposition to help you elevate the brand and artistic presence of whatever you're working on. All right, folks, let's talk pirates. Arg. All right, so we had finished the Forty and Buzzkills and Rich, and believe it or not, we hadn't figured out what we wanted to do next. We have a lot of stuff in the pipeline, but some of it takes a long time to produce, and we were trying to come up with something that we could get down a little bit quicker with some cursory <laughs> research. Uh, the, it's never <laughs> that cursory. Yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah, it is in an academic sense. It's lower than that. But really, this story has been 90 years in the making and not the story we're going to tell because it's much older than that. Yeah. The source material that led us down a little bit of a rabbit hole of sorts into tonight's topic 
was 90 years in the making because it was published in 1930. This all came from you. Uh, so this is your part of the story. But I do want to say, people, if you've been watching our social media, you will recognize that I teased a shot of a copy of the book we're about to discuss on Twitter and Instagram last Wednesday. So Forrest, why don't you yeah. talk to us a little bit about Mr. J. Frank Doby? First off, you're absolutely right. We do have a list and everybody that uh, I can catch and I have time for it to think about it, I, I take their suggestions and I put it into a Google Doc that Scott and I can share and, and Tess as well. We do take your suggestions seriously. But of course, we are always looking to mix things up and pace them so we're not doing six ghost stories in a row or a 40 and round table three times in a row. We try to keep it fresh and, and interesting for not only us, but of course the listening audience. So in this case, it just kind of struck me. I was kind of looking at a stack of books. We're all sequestered at home and I'm looking at the, the stack of books and a lot of them I got from my dad who has either gifted them to me or just boxed them up and sent them to me like, here, you take care of this now. And in this case, it's one of my dad's many many treasure hunting books. It is something that, you know, he's fascinated with the Southwest and the West in general and the Old West. So there's a lot of books on that. And it happens to be based on buried treasure and and lost mines and fun stuff like that. And this book is called Coronado's Children. And I saw it on his bookshelf for years and years. I forgot to ask him where he got it. I'll find out by part two. But this book was published in 1930 and it was written by J. Frank Doby. And it's kind of an unusual last name, and I always thought that was kind of fun. And of course, uh, now I just can only think of a house elf holding a used sock that was given to him by Harry Potter. Dobby. It's close enough. But wasn't there also <laughs> no. way back in the, this is before even our time, was there a TV show called Doby Gillis? Well, it's kind of funny you say that, maybe a little serendipitously, because... That show, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, was one of my dad's favorite growing up, and it provided a little bit of inspiration for my dad entering the army <laughs> at yeah. that time. Yeah. The lead character, Dwayne Hickman, that's what he ends up doing when my dad, uh, you know, exited high school and, and was thinking of how to pay for college. Uh, my grandfather said, well, I want you to join the army, but I think it was Dobie Gillis that sealed the deal. <laughs> really a fun show. Go look it up if you can find it, but it's funny. So back to the book though. Back to J. Frank Dobie. Yeah. He wrote Coronado's Children and Dobie and Garden City Publishing Company out of Garden City, New York, published this volume here that, uh, that I have in 1930. And it was copyrighted by the Southwestern Press. This copy seems to be a first edition, so uh, weirdly, I'm holding a 90-year-old book, I think, uh, and we're going to be sourcing this for tonight's episode, among other sources, spawning from mentions in this book, and also the Wikipedia entry is a really good one. And before we begin, I just had a thought here, Scott, maybe you can uh, chime in and, and weigh in on this. What I hadn't fully realized with legends of lost treasure and treasure hunters and their stories throughout history, so often they're connected to the occult. If you think about it this way... Buried treasure is elusive, even to the barrier. There are so many stories of someone burying treasure, even leaving detailed marker clues or a map for them to use in retrieving it later. But then even they can't find it again. That used to baffle me. Like, you're the person who buried it. Why can't you find it again? It was between the, the gun sight rocks there next to the old oak. And they go back to that same spot. And for whatever reason, they can't find it. And so much wealth and gold and treasure and mystical things are buried out in the earth that are just waiting to be discovered or will never be discovered. And I think maybe we started looking at that seriously with the Oak Island series. Well, yeah. And the other interesting thing that only just occurred to me now is like you go to all this trouble to dig it up and get it out of the earth, and then you have to go and bury it again yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you, the irony is you can't find it then because there's no rhyme or reason to where it's now buried. Before, you could actually use science <laughs> to sort of figure out where it might right. be. But now after a guy's gotten a hold of it and can't do anything with it and decides to rebury it, at that point, all bets are off. And we talked a little bit about this also, I believe, in the Oak Island series that, yeah, you can bury something and make it so hard and complicated, like Oak Island, I believe, you're really not going to want to dig it up more than once. <laughs> yeah. If you are a pirate and it's kind of your stash and your little bank account there, your safe deposit box, yeah, you want it well hidden, but you also want it accessible. So you don't want it to be too crazy. But like you said, sometimes that happens. You bury it and uh, things change. Now, this may be due to several reasons, like 
The physical, natural geography changing over time, that certainly happens. Things do look different over the the span of years with nature. Things get overgrown. We saw that with the Patterson-Gimlin film. It was kind of hard to go find that spot again. And another factor that I think may play into this is a psychological change within one's mind with keeping a secret buried within your memory for so many years. That's not scientific at all. That's just my musings. Uh, (laughs) It's a story you tell yourself so much that you start to believe it, that kind of thing. And maybe it changes over the years and you you try to keep your poker face and you don't want to talk to anybody about it after a while. That story you tell yourself or even the facts of it may change over time. But also, if you think about it supernaturally, there also often seems to be a trickster element to the buried treasure. As J. Frank Doby writes about this kind of phenomenon, using an old adage of treasure hunters is that even if it doesn't pan out to be true a lot of the time, only if it's perception, treasure hunters will tell you that you never usually find treasure when you're looking for it. You usually stumble upon treasure when you're not looking for it. Now, Doby says, well, that's probably not true. Or if you lined it up and actually studied it, right. it's probably not the case. It always just seems like that. It's like you go to turn into a driveway and there's always some pedestrian walking there, blocking you and you're stuck in traffic. It's like every time that happens. Well, <laughs> maybe not all the time. It just seems like that. Well, not that some paranormal force is moving it around underground. I'm not saying that. Hiding it from you, playing a shell game. But perhaps some unseen force is affecting your mental capacity to find it. That's going fringy and and thinking paranormal and uh, supernatural about this, that maybe something about it is messing with you, especially if it's a cursed or haunted treasure, which this may be tonight that we're going to talk about. Well, regardless, treasure is hard to find, even with ample clues. So the odds are against you, starting out. Well, this might be why no shortage of treasure hunters have turned to the occult and mystical tools to give themselves an advantage. Mother's Day is fast approaching, and the Skylight Frame is the gift that moms of all ages will appreciate this year. The Skylight Frame is a digital photo frame that receives and displays photos just simply emailed from friends and family, wherever they may be. I can't think of a more timely or meaningful gift to get mom than the Skylight Frame, something that truly connects her to the folks she loves and that love her back. And it's not just for moms. It's a really thoughtful way to keep anyone you care about instantly connected to the people and moments that matter most. And it's a heck of a lot more heartwarming than sending them something you got last minute at a convenience store. That ain't cutting it this year. Yeah, and neither are the texts with cute emojis. Uh, Plus, your brick-and-mortar store choices are pretty limited these days. Anyone you allow can send pictures to the Skylight. It's as easy as sending an email to mom or grandma. Simply email the photos to their Skylight frame, and the pictures will appear in a matter of seconds. The Skylight sets up effortlessly in under 60 seconds. Just plug in, use the touchscreen to connect to your wireless network, and enjoy. It's also super easy to walk someone through the simple setup over the phone. Or you can preload it with your favorite photos to make it an extra special surprise gift. The Skylight looks great too. It's got a vivid 10-inch touchscreen so you can swipe through the photos with your finger. And it comes in a simple black frame with a white mat. So it's perfect anywhere for adding a beautiful touch to any home. You can even tap a heart button to let the sender know you love their photo, which makes it really fun and interactive to use. Forrest and I are huge fans of our Skylight Frames. In fact, not only did we set our parents up with one, we also got one for a close friend of ours. He takes care of his older mom, so he's had to be careful of his exposure to his kids and their household for his mom's safety. So they really appreciate their Skylight Frame as a way to still feel close to their dad and the whole extended family. Right now, anything that keeps us close together while keeping our distance is a welcome gift in our lives. Your satisfaction with the Skylight Frame is guaranteed 100%. If you don't love your Skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. Now, as a special holiday offer, you can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter the promo code LEGENDS. That's right. To get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com dot com and enter code legends that's s-k-y-l-i-g-h-t-f-r-a-m-e dot com and code legends hi i'm brady and while i'm avoiding skinwalker ranch out here in utah i'm listening to astonishing legends now let's get back to the show Let's talk a little bit about Doby himself as an author. And this is one of the things that we come across when we're looking for sources. We try to verify where they're coming from. It's important to know the messenger 
in the case of these kinds of stories, mm -hmm. especially these legends and history. What do we know about Dobie? Well, I thought this was important to talk about because, yeah, you'll see some of these books. And frankly, look, you'll, you'll get some of these way out ones and you start looking up the person. It's like, well, half the things they say are really contested and they may have heard things from other people. But in this case, with James Frank Dobie, he was more of a Texas legend of sorts in academia and folklore. And I thought it was worthwhile, adds a lot of gravitas to who this guy was, and it actually made me trust his writing a lot more. And just also the way he approaches the writing and the folklore, because he starts off telling you, like, look, legends, the things that we do, are sometimes the enemy of historical fact. They're always fighting with each other. And he sort of makes an apology saying, look, this is as best as I can record it, but there's going to be some fact mixed in with tall tales and legend. And he will point that out when he can, but that's history. That's what you get. And it's up to you to really sift through that and make of it what you will. But James Frank Doby, J. Frank Doby, was an American folklorist, newspaper columnist, and author. And he was born on September 26th, 1888, and he passed away on September 18th, 1964. And among his most popular books, they usually dealt with rural customs and ranch life on the range, on the Texas frontier and the Southwest. And Dobie in his early days had worked as a newspaper man and high school teacher, and eventually was on the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. Hook 'em horns. Hook 'em horns. Well, he would go on to write about the fading of Texas ranch life due to industrialization, state politics, and Southwestern customs and culture. That was his area that he loved. He just loved that life. And was very familiar with it and collected tons of stories about it. Dobie would also go on to teach American history at Cambridge University during World War II, so this guy's no slouch. And then he returned after the war to teach in England, Germany, and Austria. And he was a well-known figure in his day, in Texas at least, because Texas politician and then U.S. President Lyndon Johnson would eventually award Dobie the Medal of Freedom on September 14th, 1964, and Dobie would pass away four days later after that. Mr. Doby would have a few schools, a museum, a post office, and a couple of other buildings named after him. So he's really got his place in Texas and Southwestern history and is a bit of a Texas legend in spirit himself. And at the front of the book of Coronado's Children, there's a dedication to his mother, Ella Byler Doby, quote, who has so often delighted me with conversational sketches of such characters as enter this book. So it sounds like she was very instrumental in his childhood, as well as his time spent on rural ranches for his love of frontier culture and folklore. And what I like about that dedication, the, the, the first part here, is that it sounds like a lot of us who have gotten into just folklore and the paranormal and, and fun stories like this, anything interesting and not in the mainstream, we had somebody that introduced us to it, whether a parent reading stories or an older sibling, a good friend, somebody who introduced us and that got us into it, if not organically ourselves. So I like that aspect of it. And the rest of the dedication of the book goes on to the memory of his father, R.J. Doby, who he says, quote, a clean cowman of the Texas soil. I love that too. Just, yeah, just it's cool. really down to the folks. And, and that's who Doby was as well. Well, who was J. Frank Doby referring to when he was titling this book on Lost Treasure of the Southwest? Well, that person would be Spanish conquistador and explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado y Lujan. Nice. Born in... Thank you. Yeah, well done. <laughs> I expect you to compliment me. I, I get them so rarely. It just, it takes me aback. Well, he was born in 1510. He died September 22nd, 1554. But from 1540 to 1542, Coronado had led a massive and costly expedition up from Mexico through the North American Southwest and into where the state of Kansas is now. I bet a lot of people don't even realize he got that far. Yeah, long way. Yeah, he got into the Plain States, a lot of it based on rumor. Well, according to Dobie, this expedition, quote, included 300 Spaniards, 1,000 Indians, 1,000 extra horses, herds of swine and sheep, six swivel guns, and a temperament as superbly sanguine as young men are capable of enjoying, end quote. Hmm. I could tell you a little bit about his writing, too. It's, it's written in a 1930s style, which is a little more formal, but he really has a way with language. And it reminds me of something that the Coen brothers would try to emulate in one yeah. of their movies. Yeah. Well, Coronado, along the way, 
He was the first European explorer to see the now well-known landmarks such as the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. But one of the expedition's missions was to locate the fabled Seven Cities of Cibola, or as it was known in the 1800s, the Seven Cities of Gold, that were rumored to be in the New Mexico Territory, which contained vast riches. Coronado never found the mythical cities of gold, of course, just villages made of straw huts and mud adobe. But along with the obsession to find other mythical cities of gold, like El Dorado, Doby perhaps fittingly infers that Coronado is the father of treasure seekers in the American Southwest. As Scott and I were discussing, I was kind of pitching this book to him, and we were, we were discussing it and taking a look through the book. Uh, he bought both a physical copy and a digital copy. Yes, that's my favorite thing to do. I like the digital copy because then you can search the text oh, in yeah. Kindle. But, you know, on the bookshelf, I love to go back to my portion of the Astonishing Legends library and just look back at all the stuff we've covered and all the things we've written. And that's, I want to see a book sitting there. Yeah. The other thing that as an amateur book collector that I like to do also is, you know, a lot of book collectors seem to look for pristine editions like Mr. Rich mm -hmm. Adam with his, uh, all his <laughs> wrapped. I look for the most worn out, you know, still held together, but I love the book yeah. that that's got some age on it, like a good fishing knife. That's yeah. Those are the ones that I, I like to get. And the plus yeah. side of that is they're a lot times a lot cheaper, even if they're rare, you know. Yeah. But this one is kind of an undiscovered one, in my opinion, because it can be mm -hmm. had for not too much. When we started, we decided we were going to do this, I found a hard copy edition used on Amazon and I got it. It's kind of tattered, but it wasn't yeah. that much. Unlike Jesse James was one of his names, which is oh, probably boy. my most prized treasure book. That book was $500. Yeah. And uh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It just, I guess it just depends on what treasure hunters are trying to use it to this day to try to find something. But there's a lot of good little clues here in this book. I didn't think of that. You know, there is a Jesse James and we might pick out stories from this occasionally from time to time, like I said, to throw them into the rotation. And of course, there's a James boys lost treasure story here towards the back. Yeah, of it, it's called but... the James loot or something, isn't it? And then, yeah, hang on, I'm looking at it right now. Let's see. Yeah. Maximilian's gold forest, I think is. Might be that story I was talking about that I saw in Unsolved Mysteries. It sounds familiar, yeah. but I need to yeah. look and about guess a truck what? burying gold in the desert. Maximilian connected, of course, to our series on the KGC. Yeah. There are so many connections in this book to things that we've covered and talked about and mentioned. And of course, the other reason that you want a good, worn, used book is that it contains the ghosts of everyone who read it before you. Sometimes you find <laughs> old notes and old pieces of paper or notes in the margin. No, that is That's fun. always kind of cool. Well, this one's filled with fascinating stories of treasure, danger, and adventure. But as I had Scott search his Kindle edition of the book for the terms ghost and haunted, those words, of course, popped up several times, which is, you know, you're onto something good here. Yeah. But the one story that really jumped out at us was the penultimate chapter in the book, chapter 18, titled Lafitte and Pirate Booty, the man of mystery, the legends. And here we are. If that chapter title doesn't say, you guys need to do a story on this at <laughs> Astonishing Legends, nothing does. And I've been wanting to cover pirates for a long time. I, I really want to do a story on Blackbeard at some point, obviously with him, yep. his North Carolina connections. And believe it or not, a friend of mine that I went to high school with actually dove on the wreck of the Queen Anne's Revenge. Yeah, you've mentioned that. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to talk to him. We'll, and we will get around to Blackbeard at some point. But one of the things that I loved about this was I actually did not know a lot about Lafitte. I hadn't really heard of him. I was like a kid in a candy store with this one. It just yeah. was so intriguing to me. And this guy was so interesting, a criminal, but he had a lot of things going on. He clearly had a gift for business, which is, I think, what helped him succeed. But it, it's a fascinating story. And uh, now and for at least two weeks, I know a whole lot about him. <laughs> three weeks from <laughs> until now. Until that fades. Yeah. yeah, until that fades. If three weeks from now, if you want to talk to me about it, I'll have to re-listen to our show first. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a, I mean, you make a good point. I always think, uh, you know, the stories we love about criminals are, of course, the really dumb ones because they're fun to make fun of. Yeah. And they do outrageous, stupid things in their pursuits. And then what you see in the movies are the criminal geniuses, the masterminds. And I just think like, man, those are so rare. You never get a Hannibal Lecter, somebody who's just so brilliant and ahead of everybody else. But I mean, yes, he did bad things, but there's something about him. And he was good at what he did. So he was successful for quite a while. And then his story changes. And it's such a mystical story here about him. 
I've actually been to his blacksmith shop in New Orleans in the French Quarter. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that in part Recently, two. Recently, right? 2018. Yeah. I'll tell that story when we get to it. Yeah. He was not there. I did not see any ghost of his, but it's apparently very, very haunted, even for the French Quarter and New Orleans. And the area I really didn't know much more about was his place in Texas history, Galveston, really. You know, a lot of times we think of pirates and, and the era of Blackbeard and Captain Morgan and all that, you know, that we know from the rum bottles. That was 100 years earlier. And that type of pirating faded out. A lot of that having to do with the British Navy clamping down on it. And by the time of Lafitte's era, 100 years or so later, it was more privateering. That was still around. Yes, it was pirating. But the days of the the real swashbuckling kind of pirating that you see in the movies, that really wasn't around as much as Lafitte. It was basically high seas robbery and a lot more political intrigue, as we'll see. It's funny you should mention that because I brought it up on the show a few times and I will again because it's one of my favorite movies is Captain Blood with mm-hmm. Errol Flynn. And all I could think of the whole time I was watching this, and a lot of people probably haven't seen that movie, but it's worth getting, especially if you're on lockdown. If you want to just see the greatest pirate movie of all time, it's the inspiration for The Princess Bride. It's the inspiration for every other pirate movie that you can think of. It starts with Captain Blood, which stars Errol Flynn and Basil Rathbone. Yeah, it's also V and V for Vendetta's favorite movie. You see that, you see him watching in his lockdown. There's a French pirate in it named Captain Levasseur that he teams up with. It's interesting because uh, historically, there's a lot of stuff that I realized when we were reading about Lafitte that was common with that. And everything else I know from media about piracy, I learned from watching the first season or two of Black Sails on Showtime. (laughs) (laughs) Which is pretty pretty interesting. I mean, it's a soap opera, but it's got a lot of, they clearly did some research on it, which is kind of, you know, fascinating. Well, good. Real characters in it. Yeah, to put that in context, I love Malkovich, of course, but what era would that be? Because what we're going to be looking at is right around the turn of the 19th century. I don't know for sure, and I can't remember where Black Sails takes place, but it felt Mm-hmm. a lot like what we've been reading about for our research on this show about St. Domingue, uh, which is now Haiti and uh, mm-hmm. that area. So it's interesting to think about that time period. It's a very fascinating period in history. One of the reasons I think that this story is perfect for us in covering this person is that as it's presented in the book, this is not just a lost treasure story. Those are fun in themselves, but this also has a ghost in it and mystery and a curse, possibly. There's a lot going on paranormally. And as we looked at William Kidd, remember him, Captain Kidd? Oh, uh, yeah. Long time For ago. the Oak Island series? Yes. Yeah, just a case in point. He was guillotined in 1701, so 100 years before this. And, you know, different part of the country, but here we're talking about the Gulf of Mexico 100 years later. Yes, maybe he had some treasure and maybe that's what was buried at Oak Island, but it fizzled out for us yes. that he never really made that much money. On the other hand, Lafitte would have a sizable possible treasure. Well, let's get to discussing the life of this guy who is not a nice guy in the larger sense. He was a criminal. He, If he didn't do bad things, he oversaw them and he profited from them. So he did a lot of horrible things, but he's also interesting. And fascinating in the way that we do like to look at the lives of criminals and a lot of people like true crime and you don't uh, condone the things they do, but you're fascinated by them. And that's kind of the case here, especially with this guy whose life you could say was really bookended with mystery. That's right. The first 20 years are not only an unknown, but there are numerous backstories, some of those seemingly spread by Lafitte himself. And also the circumstances of his death seem to be an open-ended question. They certainly were when Doby wrote his book in 1930. There's more information known now by a modern biographer named William C. Davis. He seems to have postulated a lot of details that may have come to light after the end of the most notorious part of his career. But for a long time, there were a lot of mysteries about it. And we're not to the death part yet, so we're going to save that for later. But let's talk a little bit about the early years. According to Wikipedia, Lafitte claimed to have been born in Bordeaux, France, in 1780 to Sephardic Jewish parents. Sephardic Jews were originally from Sephirod, Spain, or possibly from Portugal. Scholars aren't sure where Sephirod was, as it's a biblical place name, and it's mentioned only once in the Bible, so its original geographic location is a mystery, much like Lafitte's own background. But here he would appear to be claiming that he was born in France, 
to Spanish Jewish parents. However, both Jean and his brother Pierre later claimed they had been born in Bayonne, in the Basque region of France, rather than Bordeaux. Now, again, according to Wikipedia, there's other documents that place Jean's place of birth in one of many other French cities, although other scholars say he was born in Orduña, Spain, or possibly mm-hmm. even, <laughs> of all places, Westchester, New York. So, <laughs> well, the, well, he was smart. The property prices have really gone through the roof. There. Yeah, that's right. He'd be doing good if he just held on <laughs> yeah. to that place. Well, I think Dobie would, he's not going to contest that so much, but again, his approach and what I love about it, he cites all the vagaries of the legends and the stories that have been passed down. He doesn't really stick to one, but he lets you know about them because he writes that his birthplace has also been cited as St. Malo in Brittany, France. And that place has a long history of piracy. There was also a fishing village in southeastern Louisiana named St. Malo. That's not the place he's talking about. Like, it just shows you how place names pop up with these legends and and the inspirations for naming them. Or Lafitte was possibly born in a village on the Garonne River in southwestern France and northern Spain, or as you said, Bayonne or Marseille. And here, Dobie cites another great source, newspaper reporter and Lafitte scholar Stanley Fay, as being one of the researchers who believes he was born in Orduña in the Basque country of Spain. And Stanley Fay, we were really interested to look at his materials that he's written, but there's no published books. He does have some articles that are in a library at a university in Texas we may try to dig up, but it sounds like he really put his time in on this one and somebody that Dobie was really respecting uh, for his research. Although he says, yeah, sometimes the evidence presented even by Fay is not wholly satisfying. But what Dobie would say about him is that Lafitte could pass for either being Spanish or French. And if you looked at his behavior, he liked Spaniards as much as he hated the English and Americans. But he also spent a lot of his pirate career attacking Spanish interests. And then he goes on to say, Dobie does, some biographers uh, have claimed that his family were Bourbon aristocrats or even peasants. Jean, and I think his brother Pierre, had always spelled their name as Lafitte with two Fs. But it has since been spelled historically as Lafitte with two Ts. You'll see that on some documents that they actually signed, so you know that. But in legal English documents concerning them, It's been spelled with the two T's, and that's what's stuck. There's further speculation he was actually born in St. Domingue, which is now Haiti, and that explains how his family may have easily resettled in Louisiana, as so many French from St. Domingue did. They were motivated to leave by the Haitian Revolution. That was a revolution of self-liberated slaves against their French occupiers that lasted for 13 years from late 1791 to 1804. Now, as you can see, like any proper astonishing legend, Jean Lafitte appears to have been from nearly everywhere (laughs) and nowhere. And in this case, at least, the myths or disinformation surrounding his history might have actually been sown by him and his brother Pierre. Mm -hmm. To add to all this confusion, Wikipedia points out that one biographer, William C. Davis, uncovered several Captain Lafitte's operating in New Orleans around 1806. (laughs) And uh, that's in his book, The Pirate's Lafitte, which is a very thorough documentation Dedicated to the Lafitte boys, as it were. Uh huh. I thought you were going to say the Dread Pirate Roberts, who's just a rotating cast of characters all playing Lafitte. Well, you know, I want to come around to that. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's easy to see how these details can get lost or misconstrued. And I brought this up before, but one of the sobering things that I realized while I was researching my own family tree was how much misinformation is out there from other people who are putting the trees together in Ancestry.com. Or it, and it's not necessarily Ancestry. It's anywhere where people are working on trees, paper, or whatever. Many times this is due to misspelling of names, undocumented births or deaths, and an inability to recognize that aliases may be being used for one reason or another. And it's all too easy to find someone whose name, especially if it's not too uncommon, match someone you're looking for, and then maybe they even had the same birth year or death year. So then you incorporate their story into your family history, and the next thing you know, you've introduced hundreds, if not thousands, of people that you aren't actually related to (laughs) because there was a typo. So, and and if you're diligent, you figure it out later, but you really have to line up lots of varied points of identification. And it's the same thing with this history. Now, with all the Lafitte's in New Orleans, who were captains, no less, how could you know for sure when you're digging historically what person was who or whose exploits were connected to which captain? How could you know if a Lafitte you found in Haiti was anything more than distantly related? I mean, you can if you can line up several supporting facts and make the case for the connection in the courtroom of your mind, but you have to also remember the Lafitte name was common. Variations of it are even present today in the town of Fayetteville, in my own home Mm -hmm. state of North Carolina. 
Lafayette is related to it as well. And on top of all this, doesn't it make sense if you're a pirate and you're working against the law, doesn't it make sense to use a fake name to hide your loved ones from your enemies, conceal your background, true origins? We talked about that forest with Jesse James and the possibility oh. that the Knights of the Golden Circle had 10 or 12 guys all saying they were Jesse James so he could be everywhere at once and also be harder to track. It works for everybody, except for maybe the lead guy, the main guy who's got a big ego. It's like, hey, I don't like these second raiders, a <laughs> lot of them, mucking up my reputation. But think about it. If you are one of these people who is out doing criminal deeds, trading on John Lafitte's name, you can inspire fear as a criminal. Yes. You know, your reputation precedes you, but you can also deflect blame and investigation to the known entity. It's like, well, I didn't do that. That's Jean Lafitte. Like, well, you said you were that guy. Well, yeah, and there's no way I could have been there. I can prove I was here when that happened. (laughs) Right. And on the other hand, when you look at the the early states of journalism and information, sometimes the information had more value if you attached a famous name to it, even if the famous person was not the perpetrator of the crime or, or the legendary thing that they supposedly did. So absolutely. I mean, the long and short of it is it's hard to look at who this guy really was. Who knows if Lafitte was even their birth name. They could have had an entirely different name when they came to the United States. And there are people that have speculated on that, which we'll talk about in part two. But uh, for the time being, it's safe to say that in the time leading up to when these guys arrived in New Orleans, which we're going to be talking about, There's not a whole lot of real specific information, and when there is, different scholars disagree about it. Well, before we get into his time, his formative years in New Orleans, Orleans, I think we can leave this early section here just saying that his life was nothing but a series of contradictions and, as you said, obfuscations and mysteries. Because I believe that is part of it is one, it wasn't well documented, but also he kept it secret. And I think he did give out some misdirection, some misinformation. After all, he knew he wasn't uh, totally above board, you could say. So it's best not to have your written history until your later years. And he didn't really get a chance to do that. But let's talk about his time in New Orleans and those, the vagaries of those early years. Well, as we said a few minutes ago, there's not a whole lot to lean on here. Somewhere in there, there's probably some real facts, but how do you separate those from mistaken connections? For example, Doby says there may have been three Lafitte brothers, but history only concerns itself with the two, Jean and his older brother, Pierre. Some traditions say that Jean was adopted, but regardless, Jean and Pierre were very close. Pierre ran the administrative affairs of their criminal concern, while Jean was the public-facing image of the syndicate. They seem to arrive in New Orleans about the time of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, but it's not known what they did when they first got there, other than they seem to have arrived with money. And not long after they arrived, uh, the brothers, perhaps Pierre initiating, started up a blacksmith shop that was likely first a house built in the 1770s at 941 Bourbon Street, and this is one that Forrest has uh, been to in the past Mm -hmm. couple of years, at the corner of Bourbon and St. Philip Streets in the French Quarter. Now, some say Pierre had blacksmith skills, but it seems more certain that most, if not all, the work was done by slaves and their employee. So it seems the shop was actually a front for their enterprise, which was to fence pirated goods from Barataria, which on some old maps is listed as Smuggler's Retreat. And I don't know if you know this for us, but I was watching an episode of Expedition Unknown with Josh Gates. I think it was season four, episode 13, which is about the Brothers Lafitte and some locals that think they may have found one of his boats, but that's why we save that for part two. Okay. Josh Gates pointed out in that episode that uh, people would bring their goods up and pass them through the fence in exchange for money, and that was fencing. <laughs> that's the origin of the term fencing. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. I, I feel like maybe I learned that a long time ago, but when, when he talked about it, I was like, oh, yeah. So, Dude, um, I, I've forgotten 10 lifetimes of, of interesting oh. <laughs> factoids. So it's like, yeah, yeah, I probably knew that at some point. I don't know. But yeah, uh, yeah no, so, that makes sense here. It's a very uh, rudimentary and well-known thing. No one was keeping the secret. And also, it was a good relationship, as the passage you just read stated, between the merchants, the fencers, and yes. the uh, the buying public, you could say. They yes. depended on each other. And and also, prices are cheap. Come on, man. Prices like, are cheap. Well, you got you to pay for something from Spain with a, with a 30%, 40%, 50% markup? No, you're going to get it from the guy down the street. It's kind of an early 
Walmart deal. Well, yes, exactly. And it's all about haggling and uh, getting your best price. So here's the interesting thing about Barataria and the reason that this is important. And this is the seat of their operation in New Orleans. They have the blacksmith shop, which is where you go to get the business done. It was the main office. And I think that the, the slaves they had working there were probably doing blacksmithing. But that was really, as we said, it's just a front. What it's really about is their distribution. This is where you go if you want to talk to them about getting goods from New Orleans to somewhere else. And the reason that there was an operation in Barataria, this was a good deal south of New Orleans, down on the coast. There was an island there called Grand Terra, T-E-R-R-E, and that's where they established a base on this island. And the reason for this was is that if you were coming in from the Gulf of Mexico... This island was a little bit off to the side, down to the southeast, and you could come in there, and if you knew the bayous and the waterways in the back, you could sneak your way up into essentially New Orleans' back door, and you didn't have to go to the main port, you didn't have to pay any taxes or tariffs, you didn't have to tell anybody what you were doing, and here's the other catch, those bayous and those corridors of water were a maze. And it was impossible to get pursued in there if you knew what you were doing. And the Lafitte brothers knew them like the back of their hand. And there's a lot of speculation about why did they know them so well? Did they grow up there? Had they been in New Orleans longer than people thought? Mm -hmm. Uh, Were they children back there in in those bayous so they knew how to get away? And it's kind of like the classic thing when you come up later and people talking about running moonshine and revenuers and knowing all the back roads and how to get around. That's what they were doing down here. So when these pirate ships would come in, the, or the vessels or privateers, whatever you want to call them, and they had taken all these goods from ships in the Gulf of Mexico. Then they come to the island, and then what happens is the goods get offloaded and they get put onto smaller boats and they are moved under cover of the night up through the bayous into the back doors of New Orleans, at which point somebody's probably got to go over and talk to Pierre at the blacksmith shop and say, hey, we just got a load of X or we just got a big load of sugar. What do you want to do with it? And he says, okay, get back out on the bayou, take it further north, take it here, take it there. And the whole operation was centered around that. It was managed from New Orleans, from Bourbon Street, from the blacksmith shop, and the goods were moved through this secret port in Barataria, which Jean was in charge of. When you look at Lafitte's business successes, though, the information is probably more reliable because if for no other reason than everyone seemed to know what he and his brother were doing and that they were real good at it. And so the middle part of their life has two prominent chapters to it. And that's what we're going to talk about. These center around the operations that they had in two different cities, New Orleans and Galveston. So we're going to start out with New Orleans. Uh, I want you guys to listen to this excerpt from the book, New Orleans, The Place and the People by Grace King, which is in the public domain. It was published by the Macmillan Company in 1926. This is from page 191 of the book. And uh, this book's online. We actually have a link to it online, but you can still buy copies of it as well. Smuggling, as well as privateering, had been always a regular branch of the commerce of Louisiana. In the old French colonial days, the uncertainty of supplies from the mother country had rendered it almost a necessity of existence. Under the ironclad tariff policy of Spain, it was quite a necessity. By the time of the cession of the territory to the United States, smuggling prices and smuggling relations had been so long established in the community that they had become a part of the habits of life there. The prices of smuggled goods were far cheaper than they could possibly have been if the customs duties had been levied upon them and the relations with the purveyors of cheap goods were what they will always be between consumers and purveyors of cheap goods, confidential and intimate. I just want to say this, too, about uh, Grace King's book. Her writing, again, really amazing. This book was published in 1895, I believe. I don't have it in here, but uh, initially in 1895. I've got it down Mm -hmm. here as uh, 1926, but the first publication, I think, was 1895. So, her style is just so, it, it really sucks you in. If you can find it, whether you follow the link or buy a copy of it, it's very fascinating. So we're going to talk a little bit about Barataria and uh, what this location is and what it means to the Brothers Lafitte. And here's another quote from King's book. From time immemorial, Barataria had been associated with pirates, privateers, contrabandists, and smugglers. It will be remembered that Barataria was the name of the island presented by the frolicsome duchess to Sancho Panza for his sin as he learned to consider it. That's from Don Quixote. Now, how or when the name came to Louisiana is still to be discovered, whether directly from Don Quixote or from the source which supplied Lesage with it. The etymology of the word, 
baratir, meaning cheap, barato, cheap things. Mm -hmm. The name includes all the Gulf Coast of Louisiana between the mouth of the Mississippi and the mouth of Bayou Lafouche. So this place, and this is something it took a minute for me to understand in our research, because there's a bit of an implication when you're studying the Pirates Lafitte that they went to Barataria and established something there. And they did, but the reality is that smuggling was happening there for some time before they got there. They came in and made it work better than it ever had before. And that's what I wanted to be clear to our listeners. Innumerable filaments of stealthy bayous running between the bay and the two great streams, the Mississippi and the Lafouche, furnished an incomparable system of secret intercommunication and concealment. So as we said earlier, this is just an example of why this is the perfect place. As long as you know your way around, this is the perfect place. It's just like Beggar's Canyon back home. But uh, if you... <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're, where your still is? Yeah, yeah. That's where my still is. Okay. That's the place to put it. All right. This is the thing, though. When the Lafitte brothers got to the area and they had to go down to Barataria, there were people there. They had an operation and been going on since time immemorial, as, as you heard uh, from Grace King's book. This was smugglers area. This was most Eisley. I'm making lots of Star Wars references. This was a, it was a it was a place <laughs> oh, where all this yeah. bad stuff was happening, and that's where you went if you wanted to smuggle stuff. And I, I get the feeling it was a real ragtag sort of motley crew of people who were moving things in and around New Orleans. And but here's the catch: they hadn't really been organized. They didn't really have a plan. There was nobody there to lead them. Who was going to be the head criminal in charge? Right. So, Jean Lafitte comes down there and he looks at this operation and this is where his gift really shines for organization. Both him and his brother have this. His brother can run their organization, but Jean Lafitte can identify an opportunity. And for whatever reason, he seems to have an ability to corral some honor among thieves. Somehow he gets it out of them and he gets people organized. And he says, look, you guys are doing this all wrong. If you just listen to me, I'll make everybody rich. So he puts this plan together, but of course he has to establish himself as a leader. So this is actually from page 193 of Grace King's book. From his first subordinate relation as an agent, which was the first, by the way, the first position that he took was an agent. I'll help you. I'll help you get your stuff where it needs to go and I'll get you some money. I get a little cut. Don't worry about it. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> so he starts right. out that way. And he also is a banker. Hey, look, you know what? Stop burying that stuff in the swamp. You're not going to be able to find it. You got to wait out. There's crocodiles. Let me take care of the money for you. I promise you can get it back anytime you want. So he starts out that way, but then he starts to increase his usefulness, quoting Grace King, increased his usefulness to the Baratarians until through success in managing their affairs, he obtained a complete control over them. And he finally ruled them with the authority of a chief. This was when his genius had compassed their complete organization, had united all their different and often rival efforts and interests into one company, or as we would say today, formed one vast concern of all the pirates, privateers, and freebooters of the Gulf. Lafitte, however, did not gain his supremacy by purely logical and business methods. An old survivor of the Baratarians, Nez Coupe, who lived at Grand Terre, used to tell that among them was one Grambo, who boldly called himself a pirate and flouted Lafitte's euphemism of privateer. And his men were so much of his kind that one day one of them dared an opposition to the new authority. Lafitte drew a pistol and shot him through the heart before the whole band. So that was him coming in there and saying, you know, and, and supposedly in the things that we've read, he did not really care for violence. But he knew when he needed to use it, when it needed to be used, because there are some stories, right, Forrest, I think you read some of this in your research as well, that indicated, or at least I read something that said he had not actually been engaged in any kind of significant sea battle more than maybe twice in his life. Some of the legends were that uh, he was not a salty sea dog. He, he really couldn't literally stomach it. So he, he was better at directing things and trade on the sea. But what was said about him is that he didn't, uh, unlike these pirates you see in the, you know, in the picture books and, and movies and TV, he never carried pistols usually. He, of course, had them. But here's the thing about him. He was cavalier in the sense that he was gentlemanly, but he was skilled in their use. He was a crack shot. He was a really good swordsman. And he had a real sense of when danger was approaching, when he may need them, and he could sniff that out, and he was ready at a moment's notice, uh, which kept him alive probably all those years, because a lot of times pirates don't live all that long. 
you're doing a lot of violent things and uh, it, chances are someone's going to get the uh, the upper hand on you, get the drop on you. So with Lafitte's case, yeah, he saw himself. These are two important things. He had two steadfast rules, apparently, uh, according to Dobie, is that uh, one, strict adherence to his rules, do everything I say exactly. Two, don't call me a pirate, man. I'm a I'm privateer. A privateer. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> yeah. Then that sounds silly, but he had something about, uh, and maybe this is how he justifies it in his mind, because uh, we do see some conflicts with him, as we said, a life of contradiction in that he's not ultra violent, but he doesn't mind it being around. He doesn't, as we said, profit from it or the slave trade or all these other horrible things. He more has a nose for illegal business and how to manipulate it. And that's what you're saying, the Baratarians. He comes in and he's got a plan. He's like the the mob kingpin he's now. He don, knows how yeah. to, he's a don. Yeah, he's the don. He knows how to work all this stuff. Yeah. But but you don't cross him. And that's another thing that you will see in the mob movies where the mob boss has one bugaboo that really sets him off. And it has to do with how he sees himself. I'm no petty criminal. I'm a gentleman. But I will shoot you through the heart. So that's a good uh, legendary example of that. Well, it seemed like he knew that he had to make a point there. He had to take a stand. It's that romantic version of what happens when you go to prison. You got to make it clear that you're the HMF <laughs> in charge. You know? Yeah, that's a no. That's a good point. And and to to use the mob metaphor, it's like Tony Soprano. And this is later on in the series where he feels like maybe he's getting too old. He's losing his grip. Some guy, uh, a younger mobster, Tony makes up some offense that the guy really didn't say, or he said something. It's like, what are you talking about? And he's got to put the beat down on him and you yeah. can't fight back, but it's a young muscular guy. And he beats the crap out of him to, to make that show. Like, I'm still the lion in charge here. Yeah. I'm still the main dude. And that's exactly what you said with Lafitte. He just didn't put up with any baloney, especially these guys like, no, no, we're pirates. We're going to rob and steal. He's like, not on my watch, dude. Right. So follow everything I do. Follow it to the letter because I know what I'm doing, but you also have to treat me with respect. Yeah. When the other thing that seems to be missing from this story, at least for the most part, are, are Brutus's. Because you know, when you're that guy, there's always someone who thinks they're smarter than you that's right. gunning for your position, that's going to overthrow you. But as far as I can tell, historically, in this story, and we haven't read every book, there's another book that I'm still working my way through, a more recent one, but there's not an uprising or anyone that unseats him in this process, which is either a testament to his really ironclad control or his ability to know and root out possible usurpers before they can act or just good luck. I don't know, but it's crazy when you think of somebody in the positions of power that, that the Lafitte's are coming to, and especially Jean, that he wasn't overthrown in some way. Small business owners and entrepreneurs are facing a real challenge in the midst of the lockdowns and social distancing orders. If this affects you, you need to act immediately and reevaluate your online presence and marketing strategies. If you can't interact face-to-face -face with your customers, clients, or the general public, and no one's out and about... How will they know what services you still offer? You need to be able to send them to one official place that has all your latest news and info about what you're doing and what your plans are. And there's no better tool for that now or ever than your own up-to-date website. And you also must ensure that you have the competitive edge when the economy gets moving again. Remember, out of sight, out of mind. That's right. And Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that allows you to build a beautiful custom website and run your online business with ease and security that will keep your business or project fresh in people's minds and keep that income coming in. From websites to online stores, marketing tools to analytics, Squarespace will assist you in creating and launching the kind of online presence you've always wanted. Designers, fitness instructors, carpenters, daycare providers, no matter what services you provide, Squarespace can elevate your brand and highlight your talents. Squarespace offers eye-popping website templates created by world-class designers. However, you can feel free to customize and make it your own. The look and feel is completely under your control so that everything throughout your online presence is consistent with your brand, whether you're announcing an event, posting a blog, or sending out an email to potential customers. Behind the scenes is everything you'll require in order to be an online success, including sophisticated analytics, built-in search engine optimization, and powerful e-commerce functionality, plus free and secure hosting along with 24-hour award-winning customer service. And it's all mobile-ready right out of the box. 
So don't wait another day. It's time to elevate your brand, showcase your talents, build an online store, or just turn a cool idea into a website. Especially now that we're all relying so heavily on the internet to keep us connected to everything we want and need. Check out squarespace.com slash legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I'm Rebecca. And this is the most awesome podcast, Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Well, coming back to Grace King's book, here's another section of her book I wanted to read. This again is from her book. This is from about uh, page 193 or 194. It was in 1813 that the Baratarians reached such a pinnacle of prosperity that not only the United States felt its loss of revenue, but the shipping in the port diminished, commerce languished, and the banks weakened under the continual lessening of their deposits from the draining off of the trade to Barataria. There the blue waters of the bay were ever gay with the sails of incoming and outgoing vessels. There the landing places bustled and swarmed with activity, and capacious warehouses stood ever gorged with merchandise, and the cargoes of slaves multiplied, for the contraband slavers were always the keenest of the patrons of Barataria. The farms, orange groves, and gardens of the family homes of the privateers transformed Grand Terre and the islands around the Grand Pass into a pastoral beauty which, with the marvelous witchery overhead and about of cloud and sea coloring, might be truly called heavenly. A fleet of barges plied unceasingly through the maze of bayous between the La Fouche and the Mississippi. Under cover of night, their loads were ferried over the river and delivered to agents in New Orleans and in Donaldsonville the distributing point for the upper river country and for the Atacapas region. Uh, Skipping ahead a little bit, so perfect had the system and discipline become under Lafitte's extraordinary executive ability that it was a mere question of time when he would hold in his hands the monopoly of the import trade of Louisiana and in a great measure that of the entire Mississippi Valley. So (laughs) let's dial this back here. By the way, Normally, we would not do this much reading. This book's in the public domain, so all bets are off. And I think it's so well written. I'm really enjoying these sections really paint the picture better than we ever could. Absolutely. Um, It's just fascinating when you think about how significant his power was. New Orleans is establishing itself on the map, and he's got so much control and so much trade coming through Barataria that there's not any ships even coming into the port anymore. That's when, of course, it all comes down to money. That's when they're like, wait a minute, the governor's going to be like, wait, we're okay, fine. That guy's out there. <laughs> he's down there. Not a big deal. Right. Wait, where are my taxes? Where's the income? There's no yeah. money. Where, what's going on? How big has this operation gotten? Well, it's a perfect system if you think about it. And where we're going with this is gently creeping towards the possibility of some massive treasure that's been hoarded. Mm -hmm. And where is it? We're talking millions of dollars, $2 million a year. That's olden days prices. Uh, I'm not sure how much that would translate to today, but that's where we're kind of inching with this is the possibility that, again, unlike William Kidd, who never ended up with a whole lot of money in the end because he wasn't all that into it. Uh, his men were. That would be forty-one million today. Forty-one million. Yeah, every year, based on their trade of privateering off the Spanish ships and whatever ships were out there, <laughs> anything that kind of came through the bay, they had a pick of, and all this trade and commerce were coming in. Then you think about it, they had a great customer base because people were loving these goods that were too expensive to get anyway. This was cheap stuff that they could afford and from all over the place. So it provided variety. And not only that, these goods were going all the way up the Mississippi to uh, places like Memphis and St. Louis. So you got good distribution. You got a good corner on the market here. So everything is working. Enter the governor of the territory of Orleans originally and the governor of New Orleans, a young man named William C.C. Claiborne. This guy was out to get Lafitte. He really wanted to put a stop to him and he couldn't really figure it out. And in all the stuff that I read, it was interesting because it seemed like everything he tried didn't work, which I'm not sure if it's how history is treating him or it was because he was kind of young and couldn't figure out how to deal with this genius business pirate. But for whatever reason, almost everything he did didn't work out. And so he declared Lafitte a pirate, not a privateer. He said he's a pirate. And he put up signs and a price of $500 on Lafitte's head. But nobody cared. Everybody loved Lafitte. Lafitte was 
you know, the drug dealer that comes to town and takes all his profits <laughs> and rains them down on the poor people. Yeah. He was seen as kind of a Robin Hood, according to Josh Gates' show. So yeah. you can see how he's bringing in all these goods that these people could never afford or maybe just flat out couldn't get their hands on from the Caribbean. So they're not going to rat him out. He's the boss that everybody loves. So when the governor put this price of $500 on Lafitte's head, Lafitte turned around and put $15,000 price on the governor's head. And <laughs> in some places they say, well, he was putting those posters up right over the wanted posters for him. Or he would stand <laughs> on the street and lean yeah. against his own wanted poster and have right. drinks and just la be laughing and doing whatever he wanted. He had no fear. Finally, however, Jean and Pierre were arrested for piracy. Jean, however, hires two of the best lawyers money can buy, pays each one of them $20,000. I always do the inflation adjustment because I love that. That's $400,000 <laughs> each in today's money. Yeah. So just a few days for a modern lawyer, really. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah exactly. For their, a few days yeah, for a modern lawyer. They're $10,000 an hour. One of these two guys actually quit his job to take the gig. His job, district attorney. He quit <laughs> his job as district attorney to defend Jean Lafitte. I found this article from the New Orleans Bar Association. It's called Remembering New Orleans History, and it was by Ned Haymar. It was written in 2013. Hope I'm saying his name right. I just want to read this little excerpt from it about those two guys that he paid so much money to. Quote, the legal team failed to secure Pierre's release. Pierre was actually had been thrown in jail. But the Baratarians orchestrated a successful jailbreak, and voila, Pierre was free after all. Nevertheless, the gentleman privateer, meaning Jean, agreed to honor his debt to the attorneys. Lafitte invited them to his island stronghold to collect. Grimes, who was the district attorney, accepted. The other lawyer, he was a little bit put off of it. He was described as a New Yorker and maybe didn't want to be associated with that. <laughs> Grimes, however, did go. He enjoyed Lafitte's hospitality, but lingered too long, so the story goes. This is from the Bar Association letter, by the way. Oh, and, it was a week-long rap party. Yeah, yes. I mean, where he's just wined and dined wined and every and night. Dined. So just to, yeah, all day long. Just it, he was it engaging out. in games of chance. Ever the gambler, Grimes lost both his fee and the other guy's fee, Livingston's, Oof, lost yeah. them both, and also failed to get the charges dropped. But it didn't matter because <laughs> Pierre had gotten yeah. out and Lafitte wanted, I guess he wanted to say, hey, look, I'm a man of my word. I told you I'd pay you. I'm going to pay you. But then he invited him out and he gambled it all away. And this comes around to a thing that I want to say about Lafitte. Both of them, I think their primary motivator for everything was cash, money. What does it take? Oh my God, we paid this guy all this money. That's fine. When this is over, we'll have him out here and he'll gamble it all mm -hmm. away and lose it back to us. Grimes, it turns out, was a huge fan of cockfighting. You've got to believe that it would have been easy for mm. the Lafitte's to throw a cockfighting fight so that uh, Grimes would lose all the money that he got in his Yeah, I mean, it's a lot really of speculation. Sounding like, uh, <laughs> no, I think it's a good line of uh, uh, reasoning because it's, it's sounding more and more like the Sopranos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, do what you got to do to keep the money. He uses it to get an angle on you. Yes. Now he's going to handle on you. It's like, he's, especially if you owe him money, now he's got you in his pocket. Yeah, come on out to the Bada Bing. We know we'll have a few drinks. <laughs> we'll hang out. We'll play right. a little poker in the back room. Well, and here's the thing, too. They won Grimes over. And you, I'm going to tell you more about Grimes in a minute. John R. Grimes, pretty interesting. But one famous quote that he had said about the Lafitte's, what a misnomer to call the most polished gentleman in the world pirates. <laughs> he, that was a complete affront to him. Uh -huh. And then on top of that, there's a rumor, which we're going to talk about in a little detail here in a second, that that same widow might have been also seduced by Jean Lafitte, the mortal enemy of Governor Claiborne. The widow of the governor went on to marry the lawyer who tried to save Lafitte from the persecution of the governor, Claiborne. The, and here's another interesting thing. The wealthy neighborhood of Grimes Hill on Staten Island is actually named for their land and stately home that they built there at Capo di Monte. They built it after she went to Paris for a few years to raise her children by Governor Claiborne before returning to the United States. Some of the wealthy residents of Grimes Hill were the Vanderbilts, the Wards, and the Cunards, among others. Interesting side note, Governor Claiborne was fashion designer Liz Claiborne's great-great-great-grandfather by one of his previous wives. He was the youngest congressman to be elected in history, serving in the House at the age of 22, even though he was under the constitutional limit of 25. He'd already been appointed a Tennessee Supreme Court judge at 21 in 1796. So he definitely was a high-performing guy, but for whatever reason, he could not figure out how to be mm -hmm. Jean Lafitte. And so even though he had uh, his brother arrested and he tried to prosecute him, it didn't work out. 
So not too long after they had been arrested, a British ship showed up off the coast of Grand Terror Island, and it fired a shot to get their attention. <laughs> well, Lafitte come on. rode out to get a dispatch and invited these British soldiers back to the island, at which point they propositioned him, mostly because it was clear that Jean Lafitte was well and truly in charge of a strategic, significant backdoor into New Orleans, and they wanted to use it to take the city, to invade Louisiana. Now, they offered him $30,000 adjusted for inflation. That's $615,000. <laughs> the rank of captain in the British Army and the enlistment of all of his men in the British Navy. According to King's book on page 199, it came with a proclamation calling on Louisianans to, quote, arise and aid in liberating their paternal soil from a faithless and imbecile government. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the offer that's made to Lafitte. He decides that he wants to go talk to an unnamed friend about this. And when he goes away to seek counsel about what to do, some other of his privateers actually rounded up the British soldiers and threw them in a jail or some kind of hold. But the next morning, Lafitte showed back up and sprang them and personally escorted them back out to their ship. And I think he said, well, you know, let me think about this. I'm not sure what I'm, what I'm going to do. Then he sent a letter to Governor Claiborne, who's still alive at this point. I was shooting ahead in time there when I said after all the things that happened after he died. And in this letter, he wrote, and this is from page 201 of Grace King's book, he wrote that the choice made of you to fill the office of first magistrate of this city was dictated by the esteem of your fellow citizens and was conferred on merit. I offer to you to restore to this state several citizens who perhaps in your eyes have lost their sacred title. I offer you them. However, such as you would wish to find them, ready to exert their utmost efforts in defense of their country. The only reward I ask is that a stop be put to the proscription against me and my adherents by an act of oblivion for all that has been done hitherto. I am the stray sheep wishing to return to the sheepfold. If you were thoroughly acquired with the nature of my offenses, I should appear to you much less guilty and still worthy to discharge the duties of a good citizen. Should your answer not be favorable to my ardent desires, I declare to you that I shall instantly leave the country to avoid the imputation of having cooperated toward an invasion on this point, which cannot fail to take place, and to rest secure in the acquittal of my own conscience. That's the end of that letter. The governor, to whom the entire correspondence was forwarded, submitted it to a council of the principal officers of the Army, Navy, and Militia. They recommended no intercourse nor correspondence whatsoever with any of the people. Governor Claiborne alone dissented. So this is Jean Lafitte saying to the governor, look, I can help with this. I can help you prevent the British from doing this. I am telling you what their plan is, and I am telling you that I do not want to help them. King goes on in her book to detail an anecdote told by an unnamed woman who ran a plantation in the region who was friends with both Lafitte as well as Governor Claiborne. And on the very night that the governor had put the price on Lafitte's head, he stopped by to visit this madam at her plantation, at which point she told him he must flee to safety because there was a price on his head. He laughed it off and he was talking about this when another guest arrived by surprise and it was Governor Claiborne's wife. Now he had three wives over the course of his life and the story doesn't say which one she was, but it does say that she was of Creole descent. His last two wives were both of Creole descent from what we can tell in our research. And I think this story would have probably been about his third wife, Cayetana Suzette Bosque. And I'm not sure I'm saying her first name right, Cayetana, but it's, it's a really cool name. Could be a bosque, too, which is the Spanish word for forest. Oh, because it probably it was my... is. Oh, look at that. That's what the Spanish teacher called me in school. Bosque? Yeah, there's no equivalent of a, a forest. What a fun See, little if fact you're, if we're you're... learning to after. Yeah, I can't believe it's 174 episodes in. Yeah. And also uh, many years of friendship. I had no idea. Bosque. It's not that cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was not Jose yeah. or uh, Jaime. No, but that's cool. Bosque. Cayetana Suzette Bosque. She was a beautiful daughter of the Spanish general Don Bartolomeu Bosque from Mallorca. And apparently she married Claiborne, being his third wife, when she was only 16. So she comes over to visit the madam at the plantation, who is now concerned because that girl's husband had just put a price on Lafitte's head. So she changed Lafitte's name to Monsieur Clement for the evening. And of course, Monsieur Clement and Bosque apparently really, 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 really hit it off. In fact, mm. rumor has it they both stayed the night. Now, this is an anecdotal rumor, 
in the region. And I heard it referred to in different parts of our research, but this was the specific story. And this, again, was in Grace King's book, and who knows where she got it from, but she indicated that it was a story that she knew well. So imagine Bosque's surprise when Jean Lafitte showed up at the governor's home the day after their night, apparently. This is on page 203 of King's book. Madam Claiborne returned to the city, voluble in praise of the most remarkable man she had ever met, as she called him. She was sitting in her boudoir, which opened on the corridor leading into her husband's office, when raising her eyes from her sewing at the sound of a step, she there saw, passing the object of her thoughts, her conquest of the evening before. Ah, monsieur, I am charmed to meet you. After a moment's effusion on both sides, he asked permission to go into her husband's office. Certainly, monsieur, certainly. She led the way herself, and piqued by curiosity, she remained not out of eyesight or earshot of the interview. On crossing the threshold, Lafitte put his hands to a concealed belt and drew two pistols, cocked them, and holding them in readiness, introduced himself. Sir, I am Lafitte, the governor replied, sir. One moment, sir, you have put a price upon my head, the governor replied, upon the head of a pirate. Wait, sir, I have come voluntarily to you to make a personal offer of my services in repelling the British. I have a company of men, brave, disciplined, armed, and true to the death. Will the state accept of their services against the enemy or not? The governor looked at the man and considered. Madame Claiborne, who, as you may believe, had rushed in from the corridor, was standing by her husband, darting her brilliant black eyes anxiously from his face to that of her handsome conquest. Sir, said the governor, I accept. The men, sir, will at daylight tomorrow be awaiting your orders at Madame and this blank's plantation. So Grace King, for whoever she heard this story from, she's actually protecting someone's name there. She actually put a blank mm -hmm. in the, her book mm -hmm. about who this person was that had the plantation. So that's the anecdotal story that would indicate that Jean Lafitte, our swashbuckling guy that's running the Baratarian and him and his brother are dominating New Orleans, also had an affair with the governor's third wife at the time when the governor was trying desperately to put him out of business. The thing is, what Lafitte couldn't possibly know is that the national government was finally, at that very moment, planning a surprise attack on Barataria, and they actually pulled it off. They completely sacked it. They took hundreds of prisoners. The Lafitte boys were out of town, though, when it happened, and they escaped to an area called the German Coast which is north of New Orleans. This area is home to the Whitney Plantation, which, believe it or not, is where the plantation scenes of Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained were filmed. So if you saw that movie, then you've seen mm -hmm. this exact area that he fled to. General Jackson actually scoffed initially at Lafitte's offer of help until he got to New Orleans and found there was no real organized military presence to speak of save Lafitte's men. At that point, he reconsidered the offer and he took Lafitte up on it. Yes, old Hickory, Andrew Jackson himself, later to be President of the United States, and also with a connection to the Bell Witch. Oh, that's right. I almost forgot about that. He went to the Bell family house, right? Well, supposedly they did make a visit to the Bell Witch at the time. Now, as we said in our Bell Witch series, also there's a movie coming out, a documentary by Seth Breedlove, all yes. about the Bell Witch. So stay tuned. Hopefully that'll come out uh, towards the end of this year. But as the story goes, if you remember, this shows up in, I believe, chapter 11 of the book, an Authenticated History of the Famous Bell Witch by Martin Van Buren Ingram. Remember, he's debated and uh, it's been poo-pooed, but apparently this is the best account that's kind of contemporary for the time. And it appears in that book as the story coming from a letter from Thomas L. Yancey, who was an attorney in Clarksville, dated January 1894. And in it, Yancey explains the story of his grandfather, Whitmill Fort, having witnessed firsthand the phenomena at the Bell Homestead and of Jackson's arrival. And as the story goes, just quickly here, because it's an interesting aside, the Bell household was running out of food and supplies because of all the visitors showing up. So Andrew Jackson and his men brought a wagon load of supplies to give to the family. But it seems like he also was curious about this phenomenon that he heard about. So as they're pulling up, as the story goes, as the legend goes, the wagon immediately stops, and they cannot move the wagon. All of his men, they're pushing, nothing's happening, and Andrew Jackson exclaims, By the eternal boys, it is the witch! And at that point, a metallic voice is heard in the vegetation. 
And that voice says, all right, General, let the wagon move on. I will see you again tonight. Probably not that dramatic way. No. I don't know, metallic voice. It's pretty creepy coming from the vegetation, okay? So he's a tough military guy. He's probably freaked out a little if that story is true. But upon that, the horses began moving again. So they stayed at the Bell home that evening, and within the Jackson party was a, quote, witch layer who was boasting of his supernatural abilities to handle this witch. And in response to this, Jackson says, uh, supposedly, by the Eternals, I do wish the thing would come. I want to see him run. I think he's talking about the guy because <laughs> yeah. he was boasting so much about his abilities. Like, well, let's see this thing run him out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the entity apparently returned that night and this witch layer tried to shoot her, but the gun would not fire. And the witch countered, I'll teach you a lesson and appeared to beat the man over the head and let him out the door by his nose. At which point Jackson exclaimed, by the eternal boys, I never saw so much fun in my life. This beats fighting the British. So that's Everything's what a great connected. story. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> yes, it is, if that's true. But uh, the witch told Jackson that she would pick on a rascal the next night. And uh, the men said, that's fine. You know what? We'll, we'll just be on our way. We don't really want to see who's going to be next. So anyway, that, that's a fun little aside. But concerning this story here, this was a formative battle in the War of 1812. I think the last battle, basically as it goes, it was fought on January 8th, 1815, against the British, who were led by Major General Sir Edward Packenham and the United States Navy, who at this time was Brevet Major General Andrew Jackson. And I'm taking this just from the wiki entry here, but it, it took place about five miles east-southeast of the original city center of New Orleans, which is now close to Chalmette, Louisiana. And a decisive victory that happened in just about 30 minutes. Fast. <laughs> yeah, and a poorly executed, as it says here, British assault on New Orleans this is despite the British being so much better trained and supplied and having experience. And more people. Oh, yeah. The British had a lot more soldiers, but suffered far greater casualties than the Americans. The Americans, apparently, about 250 casualties in this battle here. In the initial assault, 333 in total, while the British army suffered 2,400 casualties overall. Yeah. So and they got a whooping. Hour. Yeah. Well, you remember that song by Johnny Horton, The Battle of New Orleans? Oh, yeah. When I was a kid, we all sang it. I don't know if kids, if that happens anymore. You know, <laughs> Where you buy school. a record and then the whole, all the neighborhood kids uh, sit around, listen to it, memorize yeah. the song and sing it. No, That's what I we just did. mean yeah. that song in particular. Probably people. Oh, yeah, sure. We ran through the bushes and we ran through the brambles, right? <laughs> Where rabbit could go it. or wouldn't go. Yeah, rabbit wouldn't go. Yeah. Well, it's fun to sing and memorize and all that. And it, of course, it's a fanciful uh, layout of the song. But as it concerns our story here with Jean Lafitte, of course, old Hickory, Andrew Jackson, was not really on board. Yeah. As you described in the letter before, none of the authorities were that interested in teaming up with a pirate of his reputation. And as it says here in Dobie's book, when he heard about this planned attack, Andrew Jackson was at Mobile. And he also heard about the British offering Lafitte this sum of cash and a commission and one for his men in the British Navy if he would help them with the invasion. So Andrew Jackson was not impressed initially, <laughs> saying, at least in the book here, issuing a thundering proclamation to the Louisianians in which he bitterly denounced the British for attempting to form an alliance with, quote, hellish banditti. <laughs> which I, I think is uh, Italian or uh, Latin for multiple hellish bandits. He says, Andrew Jackson, the undersigned, he concluded with a flourish, calls not upon pirates and robbers to join him in this glorious cause. So he, he didn't want to be seen with the likes of this guy. Well, yeah, of, of course, it's a little seemly. Yeah, and until he got down there and realized that dude was the man with the plan. <laughs> well, yeah, he reached <laughs> New Orleans and he realized, hey, uh, we really don't have enough dudes here. Not and only do we not have enough dudes, but you seem to be pretty well organized. He was familiar with the British. And that was what's funny about that quote, the uh, seeing the guy getting beat up by the Bell Witch. Well, he knew what he was up against, and he was an experienced soldier at this point, so he could suss out what was in store if he proceeded with this uh, defense of New Orleans, being undermanned. So as Dobie says here, he, he saw that and came down off his high horse, and he put Lafitte and his men in charge of two important defense batteries here. 
So the battle was won, and afterwards, Andrew Jackson gives the orders, quote, Captains Dominique and Belouche, lately commanding privateers at Barataria with part of their former crews, were stationed at batteries number three and four. The general cannot avoid giving his warm approbation of the manner in which these gentlemen have uniformly conducted themselves while under his command, and the gallantry with which they redeem the pledge they gave at the opening of the campaign to defend the country. The brothers Lafitte have exhibited the same courage and fidelity, and the general promises that the government shall be duly apprised of their conduct. Now, the rest of this text comes from page 206 of Grace King's book. On the part of the government so apprised, the president, in his message on the Battle of New Orleans, issued a full and free pardon to, quote, the violators of revenue, trade, and commerce by the inhabitants of the island of Barataria, end quote, concluding handsomely, as became the president of the United States after so glorious a victory, quote, offenders who have refused to become the associates of the enemy in war upon the most seducing terms of invitation, and who have aided to repel his hostile invasion of the territory of the United States, can no longer be considered as objects of punishment, but as objects of generous forgiveness, end quote. Yeah, so he fully was ready to let them off the hook. And, you know, when he mentions Captains Dominique and Belouche, those were privateers under the command of Lafitte. Yeah. <laughs> they were quote-unquote <laughs> right. pirates. Yeah, funny how uh, attitudes change <laughs> yes. when they come in handy and you've won the war. Yeah, and then when it comes down to what you're calling people, it's all semantics. All right, right now you're a private. No, wait, you're <laughs> a, a privateer. Nope, sorry, you're a soldier. And you're a good one. Yeah. No, wait, you're a pirate. That's bad. Exactly. Well, I've always found that that's one of the big things of history that was so funny is the loose term privateering is that you got a piece of paper, a mark that in the case of Jean Lafitte, he gave himself. Yeah, they're easy to forge. It's like, no, no, I got a license for this. It's fine. We're going to board the ship and take everything and maybe throw a few of you overboard. It's all cool because we have this under legal authority. Well, uh, another thing, Scott, I don't know if you saw this, but what was interesting about him, as I said earlier on, gaining some glory to this, is that legends sprout up about Lafitte after the battle and what he did next. As it's pointed out in Dobie's book, one legend has him going to Washington, and he blows $60,000 in fancy living. Yeah. <laughs> just having it, just whooping it up, having a good time, having now been granted a pardon. Yeah. And it's hard to know if he did that, but he certainly could have afforded it. That's a large party for him. Yeah. But not that damaging, not like the former district attorney. The idea of that and whether or not he did that plays to this image that I get of him, you know, where he's put off by the term pirate and he wants to be called a privateer he seems to be very concerned with appearances and i could right. see him based on what little we know about him and i mean this it's interesting to think of this anyway whether or not it's true you could see him going i've been pardoned not only am i pardoned <laughs> you know they were calling me a pirate i've proven yeah. my worth and now that i've been pardoned i can go to washington and do whatever i want and dance around and parade in front of these folks and go out and have big parties and and they can't do a thing about it because we've proven that I am worthy. I should be allowed to hang out with him because he did seem like he was out to prove something to a certain extent. And that's why that story, you know, of him maybe going to Washington and doing that, it makes sense. It's, it's possible because he did, he did seem to be concerned with how he was perceived. And that might have been him thumbing his nose at, at those in the government, in the United States government at that time, that had treated him like a criminal for so long, even though he was a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, honor among thieves. Yeah, he does uh, seem to consider himself a gentleman, yes. a gentleman privateer. Right. And uh, again, as long as you follow the orders and you saw him that way and just really just go let him do his crimes, he's fine with it. Yeah. Well, here's another little legend that is found in Coronado's Children, the book. As Dobie writes, it's a persistent story where it has Lafitte returning to Europe and in his own ship carrying Napoleon from Elba to France, dash, and the Hundred Days War that ended with Waterloo. Yeah. Now, why I find this fascinating is, listen to this, the story goes on that Lafitte had even made arrangements to bring Napoleon to America and that he did bring a vast treasure belonging to the fallen emperor, which, of course, he properly buried. 
But then Dobie says, impossible fictions. For impossible. The next That's points. what Dobie said. And that was a 1930 yeah. opinion, no matter how well informed right. he was. I do want to say a couple of things about that. One thing that I saw yeah. in research just today is that Lafitte and Napoleon were cousins. That's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I don't think we pointed out. The other thing that we'll remember is maybe we go back to the KGC. Wasn't it uh, Napoleon's brother that they were trying to install in Mexico as a king or something oh, like that and then there was that a, gets an assassination yeah so there, there's that whole thing which i i probably shouldn't have even opened the can of worms on because i can't remember all the details <laughs> but it's in our kgc series right. on the knights of the golden circle oh yeah. one thing i'll interject here that triggered this it's not the kgc well kgc was maximilian and and the the Habsburgs and all that and the yeah the uh, the guy that got shot and lived uh, 20 times but I was thinking of the Jersey Devil. Remember that? That was Napoleon's brother who apparently saw a Jersey Devil out hunting. And then, of course, if, if Rob Christofferson uh, was here to buzz kill that, he'd say that would ne that never happened. But yeah, we'll ask Rob about the the pink kangaroo with a human face. Yes, that stared God. him down. That's but that's such a great story. It's one of my favorite. Well, the, oh, a quick thing I didn't get to say in the roundtable was that I I just can't imagine actually seeing that with your own eyes. No, that being real like that in front of your own face. And it's just like, hey, what's up? Yes. I'm going to hop over this hill right now. So uh, go tell your friends about this. I'm By sure the get way, the kick out of it. A lot of people asked us where they could find that episode. It is Rob's show, Our Strange Skies. And the episode is called, my, I think, My Personal Experiences or Personal Experiences. It's pretty easy He to does find. recount it in that. So, yeah. yeah. So just look it up there and you'll find that episode and you can hear about the kangaroo face. What I was going to say regarding Napoleon, and this is a story I've been talking to you about, Forrest, uh, now that I'm here in North Carolina. There was a gentleman named Peter Stuart Ney who settled in North Carolina who was supposedly Napoleon's closest aide, and he was a ah. French teacher in a little tiny town here in Rowan County, and uh, they called him Marshal Michel Ney when he served with Napoleon. So anyway, lots of little wow. Napoleon things there. That's in Cleveland, yeah. Cleveland North Carolina. So <laughs> another strange yeah. story, and my, my wife's parents knew a nursery rhyme from the area about a Marshall Ney. They have a wow. little song, so I, and I'll, I'll get that for everybody. But anyway, so maybe it's far-fetched and fancy, and obviously there's a lot of legends surrounding this guy, and he seemed to indulge in them, but he was so legendary. I mean, the guy is just really legendary. You, you don't know where he came from, where he went what he did. And of course, when anything happens to him, there's got to be some grand thing that happens next. And right. so that's what's, you know, who knows what's true and what isn't true. But the weird thing is that sometimes, no, you know, if you could, if you could get the time machine, you go talk to the guy and you may be like, no, actually that did happen. Nobody believed it, but yeah, we really did that. I, we went and fetched Napoleon's treasure. It's in the Outer Banks, you know, whatever. Yeah. So it, it's, I love that kind of stuff. I love those extra details. It's fun finding all that. What's really interesting here that is this, this is wrapping up the Lafitte brothers' career in New Orleans. And there was actually uh, this, I'm going to take this from uh, page 207 of Grace King's book. It's about a ball that was given by the officers of the army after the Battle of New Orleans. General Coffey and Jean Lafitte were both among the guests. On their being brought together and introduced, General Coffey showed some uncertainty or hesitation of manner. And the Baratarian, lifting his head and advancing haughtily, repeated with emphasis, Lafitte the pirate, <laughs> I guess, in introducing himself to the general. So definitely had a, uh, he had a sense of humor, I think. And he yeah, could see, he could well, see the sure. guy was nervous. And <laughs> Well, one thing they said about him is that he rarely smiled, but he had a way of putting people at ease. Yes. Which helps with negotiations and business and politics. Yeah. Is that he, yeah, he wasn't a jokester, but people took him seriously. And yeah, he was apparently very fun to talk to. Well, within a couple of years, the U.S. Navy wound up ordering the Lafitte boys to leave New Orleans and not just New Orleans, but the United States completely, <laughs> which at that point <laughs> was right. not as big as it is now, but uh, yeah, it, yeah. it was time to get out of Dodge. And, and, and that's what they did. They left New Orleans and that closes that chapter of their story. Do you suffer from chronic boredom? Consider these signs. Have you pulled up all the nut grass in your yard and your neighbor's yard? Perhaps you've memorized the ending credits of the Tiger King. Has your dog started teaching you tricks? Well, consider playing Best Fiends. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends is clever, challenging, and it never gets old. It's unlike any other puzzle experience out there. 
There are thousands of exciting challenges and tons of cute characters to collect along the way. New levels and themes are added each month, so it's always fun and fresh. Yeah, Best Fiends is an amusing escape from everyday doldrums, and goodness knows we have plenty of that right now. Amen. I got doldrums up to my... Whoa, 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 settle down there, partner. This is a family-friendly game. Hey, I was going to say wazoo. Okay. Well, uh -huh. without a doubt, I find I could use a little distraction from current events pretty much every day now, and I recommend Best Fiends because not only is it a few minutes of fun here and there, but my family still thinks I'm taking care of all their endless requests using my phone. <laughs> and I need distractions for my distractions. But a perfect example of how Best Fiends is always fresh is this month's epic Easter Egg Hunt Challenge, where you can get in-game prizes and rewards, and the Road Warrior event, where if you complete all 30 tasks, you win the tourist Freddy Fiend character. Parents, it's great for kids. I allow my son to play in the car because Best Fiends does not require the internet, so I don't need to worry about Wi-Fi access or using my valuable cell data. You can't do that with every mobile game app. And since he's distracted for a while, I feel like I'm winning too. <laughs> well, Best Fiends has thousands of levels already with new levels, events, and characters added every month. It's hours of fun right at your fingertips. And you can even play offline. With over 100 million downloads and tons of five-star reviews, Best Fiends is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Well, with all that's going on right now, we are so grateful for The Great Courses Plus. Yeah, it really has been such an incredible and valuable and absolutely fun resource for us, our, our families, and our listeners for all these years. And especially now that we're all stuck inside, it's nice that your mind can still venture out into the world and the universe to keep exploring and expanding your knowledge and skills. Yeah, well, my mind has actually been feeling a little bloated from all the entertainment candy <laughs> we've been binging mm -hmm. on with all the other streaming services. So it's been nice to get a healthy and nourishing mind meal in there from time to time with The Great Courses Plus. Yeah, boy, ain't that the truth. But you know what I really love about it, especially now, is that, yeah, we've all been taking in so much information lately, but so much of it is noise with not much new real substance. It's just repeated fluff. But The Great Courses Plus always has information I can trust, and it's always relevant. Like, for example, they already have three fascinating courses about the coronavirus from renowned doctors and professors that present cutting-edge ideas which cut through the chatter. And if you're kind of tired about all that, there's also a whole world of learning for every curiosity. Things like playing guitar, practicing yoga, or even performing magic tricks. And of course, they'll always have your classics covering history, science, and literature. Oh, speaking of world-changing history, what did you get from our latest course, 1066, the year that changed everything? Well, what I got was that if you think 2020 is changing everything, we've of course lived through defining years throughout history that did so even more. In 1066, William of Normandy defeated Harold Godwinson in a battle for the English throne. Sure, most English folk went on about their lives as usual after that, but England and Europe would be changed forever. Before 1066, Viking raids had drawn England further away from mainland Europe and into Scandinavia. It was William's connection to France that steered England back to Europe permanently. And in a lot of ways, the England that came out of the conquest was a combination of the best of both the Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, and Norman French worlds, and what gave us the English language. Well, The Great Courses Plus is such a great supplement to any young person's education, but like you just demonstrated, any person's education at any age, and all from the comfort of your quarantine bunker as you stream it to your TV. And what a perfect time to start streaming something meaningful and valuable as a family, because The Great Courses Plus is giving our listeners this great offer. A free trial, plus it's only $10 a month when you sign up for a quarterly plan. Yeah, and all you need to do is sign up today using our special URL to get started. Find all the details at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Remember, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Sean Tate. Now back to the show. So having had their way and been kicked out the door from New Orleans, they had to find some place new to go. And they decided that that location should be Galveston Island. It turns out that pirates there had been taking Spanish ships and the booty from those takes had been making its way to New Orleans. So they had already heard about it. And of course, Jean and Pierre Lafitte noticed that when that stuff came into town. Now, Lafitte would only be in Galveston four years, but he would leave as much history behind there as he did in New Orleans. At the time, 
it was part of Spanish Texas and a Spanish colony. So Lafitte was, as ordered, no longer in the United States, by definition. Technically. Technically, yes. (laughs) Right. And now, there was a lot going on at this time, including the Mexican War of Independence, which lasted for 11 years, from 1810, starting seven years before Lafitte's arrival, until 1821, the same year that he would leave. And that's not a coincidence, really, because there's a lot of stuff going on that is pushing him around a little bit. He's sort of a a flotsam in the the turbulence. I grew up in the northwest corner of the nation, and as a kid, you you love pirates and that kind of lore, and I I love ships and sailing and the old old stories, and when you hear of Lafitte or even Pirate Lafitte, I always pictured in my mind, nothing to do with Texas. I know. (laughs) It It just didn't seem like that fit, but this is the case. Maybe Louisiana, because it, it seemed very French and the name Lafitte and all that, but I don't think I realized until I was much older and and you start uh, attending higher education classes where you realize that he put his stamp on Galveston, Texas in a big way. Yeah. And what you forget when you think about Texas is that a huge portion of it is borders the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of it. So it's a significant place for shipping and commerce. And Galveston's really not that far in the big picture from New Orleans. It's just a little little boat ride away, as it were. And it was a very long overnight train ride that I took getting to New Orleans for the first time when I was back in college. I had won second place in this photography contest, so the prize that I took was an Amtrak ride all the way from L.A. to New Orleans. And you go through all the way through Texas, and where you notice it's changing is, of course, the landscape of Texas getting into Louisiana. Yeah. And it's so dramatic that, yeah, it's hard to mistake, but then you realize, yeah, in a way, how connected they are. Well, what follows here is a mixture of information from J. Frank Doby's book, which we've been talking about, Coronado's Children, and also a book called Galveston Chronicles, The Queen City of the Gulf. And this was edited by Donald Willett and published by the History Press in 2013. This is a fascinating book, but tonight we're primarily interested in chapter one, which begins on page 11 and is entitled Cannibals and Pirates, the First Inhabitants of Galveston. As with any early North American location, it was first occupied by Native Americans, in this case, a collection of five tribes known as the Karankawa. That's K-A-R-A-N-K-A-W-A. Now, their story of contact with the Europeans plays out in pretty much the same tragic way every story of that type does. They, they were living in the area around Galveston Bay, and Willett details that they were hunter-gatherers, subsisting on whatever they could catch, and being near the water, seafood was a big staple of their diet. They were a strong people and fierce warriors who had an advantage because they could attack from the land or water. They used six-foot bows to accurately attack or defend themselves. However, they were also known for a ritual called the mitote, M-I-T-O-T-E, or mitote, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But during this ritual, they would, and, and this is from page 14 of Willett's book, quote, stake their prisoners to the ground and build a bonfire, end quote. They would then drink a local intoxicant and take turns at preordained times, and I, I guess in the music, slicing the victim up and consuming small bits of their flesh, Oof. roasting it in the fire, and eating it in front of the victim. They keep doing this until the victim is dead, and then they cut the head off and place it on a stick. Then they would also suck the marrow from the bones to absorb their enemy's strength and valor. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So these were the guys that first lived in Galveston, and um, I guess once you do that little tick mark for cannibal, everyone thinks, oh, it's cannibal, that's what they eat all the time. The impression I got was this was really just about vanquishing their enemies, not necessarily part of their regular diet. Well, it's a... (laughs) I don't it's know a, that for sure. <laughs> no, but it's an extra source of uh, vitamins and minerals. So that tells you a little bit about their history. They come up again, but uh, we're talking about Lafitte in this particular episode, so we're going to change directions here a little bit. It's now 1816, and the Mexican Revolution has reached Galveston Island. There was what Willett calls in his book a pseudo-revolutionary privateer there who was governor. His name was Luis Michel Ory, A-U-R-Y. He declared Galveston an official port of entry for the new Mexican Republic, which was the idea of the revolting Mexican people who were trying to get control away from Spain. Ari had a well-run operation in Galveston, similar to what any pirate or privateer would set up, including the Lafitte's in New Orleans, but it was much smaller, not quite as sophisticated. 
However, when a couple of legitimate revolutionaries came to town wanting to attack the Mexican coast in the name of independence, he figured the best way to protect his pirate enclave was to give those guys a ride out of town to the port that they planned to invade, Soto La Marina. They had learned that that port was undefended when one of Ari's privateers recovered some documents from a captured Spanish vessel, so they knew that Soto La Marina would not have any protection. But defended or not, the revolutionaries, uh, Henry Perry, who was an American sympathetic to the Mexican Revolution, and Francisco Javier Mina were killed by the Spanish army pretty much as soon as they got there, and Ari wound up returning to Galveston. Imagine his surprise when he got back and he came face to face with Jean Lafitte, who had simply taken over his entire operation. Ari was no match for Lafitte's resources, so he left town. Willett points out that Lafitte's first act was to declare loyalty to the Republic of Mexico, and he built a new headquarters at Campeche, which he named after an older Spanish port on the Yucatan Peninsula. Then, just like New Orleans, the Lafitte brothers went back into business doing what they knew how to do best. They were further from Louisiana now, but that was still where they sent their black market goods and slaves. No one knew the back door into New Orleans better than they did. Yeah, so I'm going to read a little passage from Donald Willett's book here, which I think really sums up what was going on during that time and that that era, and gives you an idea just how profitable it was. And a surprising name also pops up, which I, again, as a kid, never associated with Jean Lafitte and slavery. Here it goes. Quote, Soon, gold, silver, jewels, and African slaves poured into Campeche. Pierre fenced the gold, silver, and jewels at his blacksmith shop, while Jean, along with help from another famous Texan, Jim Bowie, herded these illegal slaves up the Texas coast and into Louisiana. End quote. So, yeah, I was a little surprised to hear the name Jim Bowie come up. I can't remember making that association earlier, but uh, he does make a fine knife for all of his shortcomings. Yeah, and the reason that you didn't associate his name with slavery when you learned about him in grade school is because back then they didn't tell us that part. Yeah, uh, so that's true. That was interesting to find out about. And these guys, I mean, the fact that they were bringing the contraband slaves up and then selling them, and then buying them back, and then selling them again. I mean, what a racket. And that goes back to something that we wanted to make clear from the beginning about Lafitte's character. I mean, he was involved in some pretty villainous stuff and, and things that we obviously don't condone or support in no, any way. Obviously not, yeah. uh, but we have to say it. Uh, but it also shows you how his mind works, and that if there's an angle to be sussed out, he's going to do it in a way to maximize his profits. And that's how his brain worked, although it was terribly unethical, of course. Yeah. And it, so there's that question of whether it's pure greed, which might be a motivating factor, but also you almost get a sense with as good as he seemed to be with all of this stuff that he was just driven to do it. And it, it makes right. you wonder if he even cared about the money because we, we all know people like that who have a passion for whatever thing that they're at, you know, really good at. And it's less about the end goal than the act of doing it. And maybe, yeah. maybe he was that kind of person. It's hard to know. It's a bit like Walter White in that, yeah, he needs, we all need money, certainly, but he's going to use his brains to do the best he can with that. And also it shows a little bit about his dubious nature. At one point, though he was actually a triple agent right yeah this is where it gets really crazy and and there's not a lot of history that pointed to this much sophisticated uh playing both sides against the middle or all sides against the middle in new orleans but in galveston frank doby actually reports that lafitte was somewhat of a triple agent and this is hard to follow so i'm going to try and make it as clear as i can he had told the u.s he was close by if they ever needed him but he also pledged loyalty to the Mexican Republic, the revolution in Mexico that was trying to overthrow their Spanish opposition. On top of that, he was acting as a spy on the Mexican revolutionaries for Spain, or at least that's what he told Spain he was doing. And at the same time that he was telling Spain what the Mexican revolutionaries were doing and pledging his allegiance to the Mexican revolutionaries, as well as Spain, he was attacking and plundering Spanish ships with his new network of Galveston-based privateers. So he's got all that going on. And meanwhile, he's like, oh, by the way, if you guys in the U.S. ever need any help, you remember the Battle of New Orleans, right? I'm, I'm right here if you need me. That's what I said earlier about him doing patriotic acts or on the surface, but not really being a patriot. It really yes. wasn't in his heart, but he's going to play that angle. And it goes right back to our opening quote, that very thing that you said. Well, at this time, he had built a base of operations 
and a house known as La Maison Rouge. This is a house that Dobie says a French legend explains was built in a night by the devil in exchange for the life and soul of the first creature Lafitte cast his eyes on in the morning. On page 314 of the 1930 edition of Dobie's book, he says, quote, Lafitte then contrived to have a dog pitched into his tent about daylight, so all the devil got out of the deal was a dog, end quote. Again, tricking the devil. Indeed. He's, he's that crafty. Here's an interesting passage from Dobie's book, Coronado's Children, Tales of Lost Minds and Buried Treasures of the Southwest. This is on page 315 of uh, the 1930 Grosset and Dunlap hardcover, which is the copy that I have. Forrest has one that's published by a different company, but they're both from 1930, and the page numbers match up. Spanish doubloons, said a frontiersman whom Maison Rouge entertained, were as plentiful as biscuits. Jim Campbell, one of Lafitte's lieutenants, who remained on to become a citizen of the Republic of Texas after his master had sailed away, used to tell how Galveston Bay, preceding any dangerous expedition, quote, was covered with boats seeking places to bury treasures, end quote. Once from a rich hall, so the story goes, Lafitte took for his own share, though he usually received a royal fifth, only a delicate gold chain and seal that had been removed from the neck of a Spanish bishop on his way to Rome. He gave the chain to Rezin Bowie, brother of the famous James Bowie. End quote. So uh, that's a pretty fascinating section there. It tells you a little bit about, I mean, when you think about this, these ships, they're just pouring in, they're burying treasure everywhere because there's nowhere to put everything that they're taking. And you have to think about the scale of an operation like this. And it's the same thing in New Orleans. When you are stealing so much and you don't have anywhere to put it, it tells you why everybody is constantly digging and looking for stuff because there's no question that it's out there. It's still out there. There's no way it was all recovered, especially when you think about the lifestyles of the guys who were burying it. Yeah, and that's never changed because think about guys who steal a priceless painting somehow. They manage to do it. You really don't want the painting. You want to convert that into cash. Well, you just don't put that on eBay. You have to find somebody who's wealthy enough and unethical enough to pay the black market fenced price, the illegal price, to have it in their own private collection where them and maybe a few close friends are the only ones who are going to see it. So with all these golden jewels, it's like you can't have something that stands out as uh, on your person as Spanish booty or something that could be identified as belonging to a former owner about your person. So you really want the money from that to go have a good time with. Well, yeah, it's, it reminds me of a Goodfellas when the one guy goes out and gets the Cadillac <laughs> and the fur coat. Yeah. Well, the fur coat, and then immediately like, no, 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 yeah. give me the coat. Yeah. yeah. It, it, what no, are you that's doing? what, what you doing with this? What, what did I tell yeah. you? What did I tell you? Yeah. And, and that <laughs> anecdote was great because, again, like a mob boss, he's taking his quote unquote royal fifth. The money goes up. So he's taking that money and uh, he's squirreling it away somewhere. But this is all, again, leading to the idea that there is treasure out there that was stolen and never recovered. That's so right. much of it that it's got to be somewhere. That's right. And again, that just now made me think of the story of the sheriff, Henry Plummer, where you may not believe he was guilty. You might. Uh, you might believe all the stories. But what we tried to say in that series was... People got money stolen, lots of it, and it went somewhere. It went somewhere. Yeah, it was never recovered, so it's out there, either buried or converted, or somewhere, somehow, that money disappeared. Yeah, it's in the system, even if part of the system is buried in a hole somewhere. Right. Well, when you think about it, this was Lafitte's second chapter, really, for both of them. Jean was 40 years old at this time, and they called him the Lord of Galveston Island, according to Dobie. According to Willett in Galveston Chronicles, a plundered ship had a load of bright red paint on it, and that's where the paint came from to paint his famous house, which uh, the Maison Rouge, which is now long since gone, although the foundation of the structure they think it was built on still stands there, and some people think that that's the original foundation, even though it was connected to a, a second home or another home that was built there that's also gone. There are people that speculate the foundation is the original foundation. At this time, the Karankawa were still in the area, and relations started out peacefully enough for Lafitte when he got there, and as pirates or privateers, but there were not many options for companionship in Campeche, and after a period of peace, some members of the pirate community kidnapped and raped a Karankawa woman. The fierce tribe planned a retaliation, and uh, after laying in wait for some men who had, I think had gone out on a hunting party, they killed four men in a skirmish. Lafitte then staged an attack, and what followed was a horrific engagement between 200 pirates with two pieces of heavy artillery against 300 Karankawa, 
armed with bows and arrows and spears. The battle lasted for three days, and Willett points out on page 20 of his book that, quote, the Karankawas fought gallantly and wounded many enemies, but in the end, their arrows and war clubs were no match against Lafitte's guns and cannons, end quote. Thirty Native Americans died, and the rest of the tribe fled the island forever after that. The next year, in 1818, however, a hurricane wiped Campeche pretty much off the map, but Lafitte rebuilt. And that's something that Galveston is very, very exposed to hurricanes coming up the Gulf. Yeah. And it's something that's been a problem for it for quite some time, much like North Carolina and Florida. Well, in 1820, disaster struck, however, when one of Lafitte's pirate captains attacked an American ship. This is from page 316 of the hardcover copy of uh, Dobie's book, Coronado's Children. In time, an American warship put into call on the Lord of Galveston. His letters of mark, furnished now by Mexican revolutionists, authorized him to prey, as usual, upon Spanish shipping, but his men frequently made no distinction in flag. So the point is here that they were not supposed to attack American ships, but some of his pirates <laughs> did that anyway. Well, they're pirates. It's yeah. hard to really coerce criminals into sticking to the straight yes, and narrow. this one, but not that for one. Yeah. So to show his sentiment and patriotism, Lafitte had an offending pirate hanged on the seashore and the warship departed, but the offense against American traitors was soon repeated. Lieutenant Kearney, in command of a United States man of war, appeared one day in 1820 with polite orders that Lafitte abandon Galveston. So he did. He left forever. The rest is legend, mostly about pirate treasure. So that's Dobie's wrap up there. But yeah. that was the final straw. And Lafitte knew better than at this point to mess with the United States, which was growing stronger and stronger. Yeah, they did not have much of a navy to speak of compared to England, France, and Spain, of course. But it was growing as a nation. And of course, Lafitte could not match that. And I believe his men burnt down Maison Rouge when he departed. The whole town, listen to this. This is from page 20 of Willett's book, The Galveston Chronicles. Quote, the Americans informed the pirate prince that it was once again time for him and his followers to cease illegal maritime operations or face the wrath of American naval might. Like his Indian counterparts, Lafitte abandoned his fortress, put Campeche to the torch, and left Galveston Island forever. That's on uh, page 22 of Galveston Chronicles, the Queen City of the Gulf, Arcadia Publishing. And that's actually in the Kindle edition of that by... Uh, will it. So yeah, he burnt the city and well, left. He t leave no evidence behind. So there's a lot of different stories about what happened after Lafitte left. Now, back in 1930, when Dobie published this book, I think that they pretty much thought this was the end of him. But future biographers have found more information about where he might have gone after this. When, and we'll talk about that next week. But for now, this is the end of the most prominent part of Jean and Pierre's lives. After they had done what they did in New Orleans and were immensely successful at it, they came and did pretty much the same thing in Galveston, but for less time and probably not to the full scale of success that they had in New Orleans, before they had to leave because some of his men uh, accidentally attacked American warships and the, and the American Navy was getting to be something that you couldn't mess with. So they left town, and that day, a lot of legends were born about Jean and Pierre Lafitte. You got to leave in a flourish like that. It reminds me a little bit of the legends that were born after another big departure, and that was the Knights Templar, where Jacques de Molay was burned at the stake at the order of King Philip IV. As the legend goes, in order to give enough time for three Templar ships laden with treasure, to leave France and escape. And where they went to next is anybody's guess, but it launched a lot of legends. Same as this, where you leave in a flourish, he takes off, and that ends up sparking a lot of new legends, which have lasted to this day, and historians and treasure hunters alike are still trying to figure it out. Well, next week, we're going to return with stories and possibly, possibly, even an interview with a man whose family claims to be direct descendants of Jean Lafitte himself. And they think they may have found his last ship, the Pride, as we said, scuttled with an immense treasure aboard just before he fled Galveston. And we're also going to touch on the numerous ghost stories surrounding Lafitte's stomping grounds, both in New Orleans as well as Galveston, such as the Campeche Devil Dogs, born in the eye of a hurricane, imbued with dark powers by a voodoo queen who died just as she performed a ritual over the birth of the last one. And like any great legend that involves murder, witchcraft, 
treasure, mayhem. It has a great ending note because to this day, 12 of these terrifying supernatural canines are said to be standing guard over the buried treasure that Jean Lafitte left behind. That's going to wrap up part one of our two-part series on Jean and Pierre Lafitte. We'll be back next week with part two. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Sean Tate. I am Chupacorn on the Cobra. Hi, I'm Skinwalker Ranch. If I'm saying that right. Galaxy Void in Perpetuity. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>